If I can start with Vulcan 7, I mean, clearly you, you two have known each other for much of your lives, but I know you're also, you're both very prolific, you're both doing an awful lot of things. So where did Vulcan 7 come from? Was it something that you'd wanted to do for some time, or was it suddenly a, a, a blinding flash of inspiration? We'd had a kind of instinct to be doing a play together for about 25 years ago, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, we'd been sending each other scripts back and forth, saying, what about this one, what about that and one? And then we met on one that nearly worked, and we went for a bit of a boozy lunch and decided we'd write our own, because we were better writers than they were. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that was basically it, wasn't it? That was basically it. Just, the whole thing is a, whole, is a huge act of hubris. <laughs> well, it, it was also because none of the plays could do exactly what we knew our strengths were. So we just yeah. thought, well, we'll write around. They didn't have big enough parts for us. That was <laughs> it, really. So in fact, there's only the two of you and one other character in it. So that's right. Yeah. The yeah. That's well. a yeah. bit, yeah. 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 But once again, I, mean, I haven't seen the play, but I've read up on it, and it seems like they're kind of, they're kind of losers, the pair of them. Um, they're, they're people who have reached a kind of point in life where they're, they're measuring each other, you know, measuring themselves against each other. And neither of them really ma match up to their own expectations. Yeah, they kind of, it's, it is about a couple of dinosaur yeah. guys. Is is what it is, and how well, because it's also because it died out. It's also about the third character. The, the third character is a, is a is a runner, a female runner, uh, who's only twenty four, and it's really it's really about our attitude to her. It's not people think it's about us, but it isn't. It's it's about yeah, yeah. it's about how old and decrepit their minds are in the face of the modern world and she represents the modern world she also represents a kind of strand to our past because she she, she might be the daughter of one of us there he's given the plot know. away now well it's not you won't you won't know much people will still come and see it i'm sure yeah yeah, yeah. Like but the trailer the tips up like that as well during yes it. but that's <laughs> not giving the plot away yeah, yeah. That that, that's just really frightening <laughs> yeah the description you just gave us that's kind of me and my junior colleagues you know me running increasingly fast just to try and keep up with the technology yeah. i mean you guys are you're early 60s now i guess is, is that is that you as well uh, there's definitely the exaggerated bits of us i'm actually obviously rather young and with it and uh, know everything about yeah. modern technology um, An interesting thing, though, no, for us has been no, writing our own, um, uh, writing our own autobiographical, put, putting them in, but not necessarily for one's own character. So there are bits of me in his character, there's bits of him in my character, and that's actually quite an interesting uh, experience to have done. It's also about how ridiculous it is to be an actor. Um, yeah, it's it a is about that. It's a really stupid profession to have got into. And most actors spend most of their lives, film actors, TV actors, spend most of their lives sitting in a caravan. Moaning. Moaning to each other. Yeah. There are days when I find myself saying, this is no job for grown-up. Yes, yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I guess it's, it's kind yeah. of like Especially that. when in this one, I've, I've been sitting there for six hours when the play starts, dressed as an enormous lobster. Um, yes. You know, so it's... Um, waiting to film. Waiting Hurry up and film. wait is the yeah. expression that's used in the film business. Hurry up and wait uh, is kind of sums it all up. And the, the, the creative process, I mean, the two of you obviously you're working very closely together when you're writing it, when you're rehearsing it, when you're performing it. You guys have known each other, I guess, for, for 40 yeah, plus years. Yeah, 40 how, years. How does that work? I mean, how do you end up not kind of punching each other in the face from time to time? Um, well, we used to. Um, did we? We've never no, punched not punching, you in the face. Not punching in the face. No, we've never had a row, have we? Not really, no. We just you always used to have your rows with Pete. Yes, I used to have rows with uh, my double act partner. Yeah. Peter Ritston. I used to have sulks with mine. Yeah. yeah. Creative sulking. Creative sulking. But yeah. do you find the two of you spark off each other when you're writing? Yeah. We've had a very good writing experience. I mean, writing is quite an odd thing, and I've, I've written in a lot of partnerships, and uh, I like it because it's generally rather convivial and rather sociable. It's more fun. I mean, I write a lot. I write plays on my own most of the time now, and it's a lot more fun writing with someone else. Um, because it's shared the responsibility, you, and, and you, it's also well, funnier. you also get um, you get instant feedback on ideas for lines, plots, you know, scenes, anything. It's you get an instant kind of thing, and you just got to trust each other, really, if you know, and not yeah. kind of uh, said that you're. Well, you've you just got to trust me. You feel confident, kind of offering up ideas that the other person might not like, and they're allowed to say they don't like that, and then you just move straight on. You don't you don't linger. I mean, Vanity and egotism are the, are the main killers of any kind of right, creative yeah. partnership. It's hard, yes, it is hard. Yeah. It's hard to, to imagine that. that vanity might exist in the theatre. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, yes. exactly. 
Exactly. But you've both done, I mean, you, you do theatre, you do films, you do TV work, you've both written books. Renaissance men, if, if you like. Um, does that keep it fresh? <laughs> if you like. If you like. <laughs> if you have to, yes. Doing a bit of everything for both of you, does that help to keep it, it it's, fresh? We're either Renaissance men or we're very desperate men who'll do anything. <laughs> <laughs> I think the latter. <laughs> Renaissance man I, I, sounds like tights and, and doublet. And I think it's a kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's a spectrum, isn't it? And, and we're somewhere on that. We're on the spectrum. But as, hmm. as the creators of Vulcan, so how, generally, how good do you think it is? Should people come and see it? Here? I think it's got, uh, it's got some genuine kind of depth to it. It's got some meat to it. It's, uh, it, it's, we're trying to be funny, but we're also trying to deliver... Some, something about us, yeah, and trying to play. deliver something about people, yeah. uh, humans, what it is to be a human, what it what it is to kind of coexist with other people. It's a it's it's kind of it's a proper play. Yeah. Um, but it, it happens to even at my my favourite thing is even at the most dramatic and moving moment, there's suddenly a laugh line, and and when I, just as an audience member, that's my yeah. favourite thing is when you've got. You've, you've got the crying line and the laughing line in the same moment, yeah. that very same moment. And uh, so you don't know half the time, oh, should I be crying at that? Should I be laughing? And, and, and if you can get that, then, yeah, that's what makes it worth watching, I think. My real life, isn't it? My yeah. character's got a line about um, uh, his very, uh, uh, the depth of his despair. He, he moans about the fact that he's never cooked a chicken, um, which always gets a very good laugh, but it then goes on to be, you know, he's never cooked a chicken, he's never put a meal on the table for a family, he's, he's been an awful father. And so, so the laugh, and it's quite a big laugh where it comes because it's the way it's structured, then sort of people get guilty about laughing and it's, it's lovely. Yeah. That's, that's the kind of thing I I'll like. tell you what, yesterday you even got a laugh on, you, you, he has this speech about how he, he, um, his life is a failure and then he's, he's drunk, his character's drunk, and goes, oh, God, I hate myself. And they have got a big laugh. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very cruel audience here in Cambridge. Oh, they are. Oh, they're tough. Very yeah. tough. Yeah. Yeah. We've all done that thing where you, you, know, you want to laugh at a funeral because something happens at the funeral that is, that is funny. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess we've, many of us have felt guilty about doing something like well, that. My, my theory is that laughter and crying are at the same end of the spectrum. Yeah. And the other end is boredom. Yes. But laughing and crying are very near each other. I, th I agree with that. And some of those great, you know, the great American series like The Sopranos, you've got, the, you've, you've got exactly that experience, haven't you, with a, at a funeral scene. They're making jokes, but it doesn't take away from how, how moving the scene is. That's the, that's the ambition with Vulcan 7, is that we would create those sort of moments. If we take a little step back in time now. I mean, when I was a teenager, yes. suddenly this, this programme came on and it was for my generation, and it wasn't Monty Python that my elder cousin kept banging Was it not the, McLean, not the Nine O'Clock News? It was not the Nine O'Clock News, we all watched it. <laughs> yes. And it was fantastic, but then something else came along, the young ones came along, and that really, I think, I think Joe Strong had said of, of punk music, that when it came, you were either for it or against it, and it kind of, it defined people within a generation. And like, do you think the young ones mm. did that? I mean, my parents loathed it, mm. still do. My parents loathed Monty Python in the same way. So when I was a teenager trying to watch that, my dad actually said the words, it's too silly, um, and wouldn't let me watch it. So I, I'm, I'm aware of the kind of divide. I, I'm not, I must admit, I'm not. I mean, maybe, it, I think people of all generations, I don't think it was a generational thing that divided it up, personally. That's my, just my experience. You've both done so much since then. Do you get tired of answering questions about the young ones? Because it was now 30, 35 years ago. Uh I'm, I'm flattered that people uh, remember it, but they mostly remember it better than I do. So yes, I get people I saying, that. they come up to me and say things like, it was John. And, uh, and it I means nothing. It means yeah. And they're expecting a punchline, and yes. I'm, I'm, I haven't got it. <laughs> well, sorry, yeah. I can't help you there. In moments of exasperation, yeah. my wife will say, kneel, kneel, orange peel. That's yeah. right. Time yeah. Time. Yeah. And just certain things that just enter the vernacular. Again. Yes, yeah. my mum once uh, made a steak for everyone in the family, and uh, except me and said, no, but you're a vegetarian. Uh, and I said, no, I'm not. This was around the time <laughs> I was... <laughs> That's how much you get typecast <laughs> when, you've, when you've done a role like that. Even, I like even it when... Own when mother. <laughs> I like it when bits of, of sort of telly dialogue get into human life. It's nice, isn't it? Whenever we have soup, Jennifer says, 
two soups. <laughs> <laughs> I get I get sausages. Gosh, yeah, yeah. That sausages. all the time from bad news oh. that, that Adrian wrote. It says sausages here. <laughs> and, and then, you know, it, comedy kind of changed for me at that time. The, the kind of the comedy that we've been used to watching, the, the stand-up, the Bernard Mannings of this mm. world. Suddenly there was something that people of my age wanted to sort of rebel against. And you guys really took the ball and ran with it because it wasn't just the young ones. It was the comic strip, it was Filthy Rich and Cat Flap, it was, it, you know, an awful lot of things that you did. Do you feel that you helped, played a part in changing comedy in this country? We definitely made some programmes that hadn't been seen before. But I, I think they're in a tradition of other people's stuff. I, you know, Billy Connolly was already around. And, mm -hmm. and I think Morecambe and Wise and Tommy Cooper and Laurel and Hardy are all people that Rick and I... We're doing silly stuff. ...were, were trying to kind yeah. of emulate, you know. Uh, and being stupid, yeah. We were basically being stupid. I think the, the, the thing that changed in terms of the young ones, most comedies tried to have funny, likeable people, and the premise of the young ones stuff was to have four unlikable people. It didn't work because they all ended up being likeable. You know, people would knit toys. They ended up being out loved, the end, which is ridiculous. You know, yeah. yeah, we we did set so it failed. It was a failure of a program. The least, wasn't it? You failed know, the, completely. The least like like people we could possibly think of. You know, and way, now, that's what we've done now you know, with the with the characters we've got now in Vulcan Seven. They they are pretty obnoxious <laughs> dinosaurs. Well, that's going to be my next question because you know the, the young ones, the three and filthy rich and cat flat bottom. They're all kind of losers, mm. aren't they? And these guys up here, they're, they're sort of losers too, aren't they? I think most people are losers, aren't they? And the ones that, the ones that are winning, the ones who say they're winning are, are usually quite hollow um, and sort of sad. I think we all think, think we're losing, don't we? I, f I feel like it. <laughs> I think the older you get, the more you feel like that, certainly. But I think I've always felt that way. It's always felt like it's a lot of uh, thrashing under the water to keep my head up. But at the same time, you know, last year we saw you, I think it was last year we saw you in that wonderful production of War and Peace. Yeah. I mean, some very serious acting going on. You've done some, some very serious acting too. Looking back to yourselves when you did The Young Ones, would you have settled for that, you know, appearing in big productions? I became a comedian by accident. Same with Rick. We just, we, we, we just started doing lunchtime theatre to try and get equity cards, and, and it didn't work, and we ended up with a career in comedy. Um, I think had you asked us both at the beginning of, of uni where, where we were going, we would have both said the RSC, you know, so I mean... Yeah, so that's what uh, I went to drama school, yeah, and thought, oh yeah, I'm, I'm off to be an actor. Yeah. That's what I'm, that's what I'm off to be. But also I'd always written um, comedy plays and things with other people, and so that was kind of a, a bug that was messing up my acting career from an early stage. Mm. <laughs> Which do you prefer these days? I mean, is, is comedy still your preferred medium, or do you really like to get? Depends started? what you mean by comedy. Comedy has become a, a much overused word. It covers a whole kind of plethora of art forms. Let's take Fleabag, for instance, which is a brilliant program. It's called a comedy. I think it's it's a really brilliantly exciting drama there's very little comedy in it um, there are some la there's some laughter bits in it but it's not a comedy Malcolm and Wise's comedy that isn't so so we've got we've got this huge kind of world now especially in the kind of world where they they don't make studio sitcoms anymore so you can't hear anyone laugh so you don't know whether so the people making it are second guessing whether people are laughing or not and they and in the end they don't they, so they stop second guessing and they don't bother wondering whether one is laughing, they just make what they think is funny and no one knows. <laughs> and the group that came out in the, in the early 80s, I get the feeling that you're all, a lot of you are still kind of in touch, that you are still a, a group of people. If you like, well, the, the comic together. strip group in particular, I mean, which yeah, encompasses yeah. yeah. R2, Double X and, and Dawn and Jennifer. Uh, well, he's obviously in touch with one of them. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, um, but yes, we are sort of all in touch. We all knew each other intensely for a period of time before anyone m made anything on television so we 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 all know who each other is really yeah and i think that helps sort of keep us together as a and as it's a very group. interesting to see over the years talking about this measuring yourself later in life see how things that maybe made you angry before don't now or see how people turned out and uh, 
it, it's very nice. I, f I feel it's very nice, like an alternative gang, you know, an alternative family that I feel part of. I, I, I like that feeling personally, which I yeah. never thought I would. And so many of you are, are well-known people now. Did you know at the time? Did you think, my God, we're a talented bunch and we're all going to go a long way? I think we were having a, a really good time when it was all happening. and I don't think anyone... I certainly didn't. Young actors these days seem to have a plan and a career in mind. I think we went from... And in com young comedians, from particularly day, We these went from days. day it's to like day. a career, isn't it? I'm going into comedy and yeah. they learn... You can even do a course in stand-up where you learn to make joke-shaped statements <laughs> that might not be funny, but they sound like a joke, so people laugh. And you, 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 you sort of have a career path. I don't do jokes, I do a lot of joke shapes. <laughs> yes, joke shapes. And um, it's a career move, but of course the circuit, that circuit and that career path didn't exist at all. It was a, it was a really dumb thing to we do. We invented it, didn't we, Nigel? Well, we sort of we did. did. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. It's, it was a dumb thing to do, to just say, well, let's, let's do, we'll, we'll pursue our careers and our acting and writing careers, but in the meantime, let's just do this stupid thing in the evenings, in the late night, in the clubs. And, and that's what turned into the, the, the sort of the mainstream eventually. Yeah. That's pretty Being good. stupid. Yeah, what have we done? Yeah. <laughs> well, just one, one more question. Like, I mean, what, what does comedy need to do? I mean, I suppose that you, you could say about any time in history, but you know, the state of the country at the moment. It seems it seems weird to me that you know, in a in a at a time when the country is is definitely kind of being rocked uh, economically and and kind of um, politically, that there isn't more acerbic comedy on the television. You know, where's the spitting image? Where's 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 the yeah. hard sort of yeah. commenting? comedy we've got the news quiz and things like that but and i like the news quiz but it there's there's none of the visceral stuff that was around when thatcher was up and we're in a similar situation i don't understand it because it normally happens you know it happened in germany with the weimar republic sort of grew the cabaret movement so all these things usually grow a, a really decent kind of alternative and there is no new alternative everyone's just doing everyone's actually Becoming like Bernard Manning again. They're doing joke-shaped <laughs> things all yeah. over again, isn't it? Yeah. It's all gone joke-shaped. Bernard Manning has now become the alternative. Yeah. It's yeah. not a pleasant thought. Yeah. But gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Cheers.